This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. You're listening to the Podmania Pro Wrestling Podcast, a sample of the best pro wrestling podcasts we can produce on our tiny budget. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addict, CastBox, and all other podcast platforms. If it's wrestling you want, check out more of our great content at podmania.co.uk. Let's do this. Welcome to Pod Mania Rewind. And not in any way frequent look back at some of the archived episodes of our four year run as a podcast. With Money in the Bank around the corner, it's time to look back at Rob and Garth's retro review of Money in the Bank 2016, a night that shaped the newly announced brand split significantly. So sit back, relax. And join us as we review possibly Dean Ambrose's best single night in the company and a night that saw far too much intimacy between father and son. I'm joined once again by Garth. How are you, my friend? Oh, good, yeah. Had a bit of a break, so it's been good. Lovely. Bank lovely. holiday. Well, very nice weather on bank holiday as well. I spent yeah. it in Manchester drinking, which of course is the only way to spend any bank holiday in the sun, Unless... drinking. Unless you've got kids. Unless you've got kids, which I don't and you do. So <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> we had very, very different bank holidays. Oh, yeah. Um, but obviously it is money in the bank fever in WWE at the moment. And though the build up to money in the bank 2018 has been sketchy, there have been some, <laughs> let's call it interesting little bit, uh, little bits of build up. As we uh, get closer and closer, we decided that our next retro pay-per-view review should be a Money in the Bank. And yeah. I chose Money in the Bank 2016 from the T-Mobile Center in Las Vegas. Now, Garth, what did you think of the show? I thought it was all right. Like I said before, I, I couldn't... There was bits I remembered and the bits I just completely forgot from watching it originally. Yeah. Um. It started off really bad, <laughs> and I I just I thought it can't it can't be this bad all the way because I remember quite enjoying it at the time. So, but there was there was some bit in it I'd completely forgotten that like totally popped for them. <laughs> I know which good. bit you mean. I know which yeah. bit you mean. We all know which, which bit good. you mean. Yeah. Um, to be honest, when I sort of recommend when I sort of chose this show, um, as it was my cho- uh, my turn to choose. Um, I'd got this sort of rose-tinted glasses approach to this pay-per-view because Money in the Bank pay-per-views, since it you know since it garnered its own pay-per-view, they haven't exactly been they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. Yeah. Let's say, obviously, the ladder matches are always a highlight. The ladder matches are fantastic, nine times out of ten. But the matches surrounding the ladder match, very very rarely. Do they live up to expectations? And the reason I chose, pardon me, this one was because from what I remembered, there was a, some very, very good matches. And there were, but you are right. It is a pay-per-view that started very, very slowly. Yeah. Um. My, one of my favourite parts, straight off the bat, JBL, what the fuck? His commentary <laughs> is abysmal. Um, I'm just I'm so used now to having Corey Graves there with Michael Cole that yeah. now that we go back to JBL, just the utter nonsense he said. We there was a bit where it cuts to the outside of Las Vegas as you know as it would, and Michael Cole said, "Oh, look at the strip! Some fantastic fights have taken place here." Obviously referencing boxing, mm. and uh, then said to JBL, "What do you think about that?" And JBL said, "Yeah, but the main event's going to top them all." Now is it? <laughs> Is it, JBL? You... He said some absolute shite during this thing. I like... swear, sometimes JBL speaks because he panics if there's silence. <laughs> and whereas Michael Cole is far from my favourite on-screen personality, um, like, by far not my favourite, 
at least he knows now when to shut up. Yeah. I think um, having uh, GBL on here, it highlighted some of the bad parts of Cole as well. Yeah, it did, because it felt like Cole had to do two jobs. Yeah. Because JBL, just, I don't know. And it's not because I don't like him. I mean, I don't like him, but <laughs> I just, I don't feel like he added anything to the commentary team. No. Um, Byron Saxton was was Byron Saxton. Um, <laughs> you know, just, again, didn't add anything. He just tagged something on at the end that, you know, didn't make any sense or just yeah. didn't matter. Um, but JBL had been, you know, on commentary for a while before this, and you'd expect, yeah. I don't know, something a little bit more intuitive than what he was actually giving us, which was, for all intents and purposes, crocs of shit. <laughs> um, but before we start with the main card, we must very briefly talk about the pre-show. Uh, this is one of the very, very rare pre-shows I actually remember watching. I didn't watch it for the review. Um, I, I, I didn't did. see it. I, I do remember it very, very briefly from when I watched it back in 2016. And, of course, we had the Golden Truth taking on Brizango, where Brizango had sunburnt from tanning, and that meant that the Golden <laughs> Truth just walked around slapping them, which genuinely, at the time, was quite funny. It hasn't aged well, but See, was that, quite funny. I'd rather saw that on the main one than the, the Sheamus match. Well, yeah, we, <laughs> we'll get to that, trust me. Oh, Sheamus. Um... And Goldust and R-Truth, obviously they had just become a team and they got their first victory. As a team, Goldust celebrating as though he just won the World Championship. <laughs> Goldust's finisher is still absolutely fantastic. It yeah. really is. The final cut is just, it, it looks so nice. And when you consider how old Goldust is now and how he's still executing it, he, he just deserves a little bit of a round of board, a little bit of recognition. Oh yeah, Um it's quality. Just even if he comes out, you know, to challenge for the Intercontinental Championship for an open challenge or something, just just do that. Give him some more TV time. He deserves it. Um, this was followed by a decidedly not good match uh, between the Lucha Dragons, Kalisto and Sin Cara, and the Dudley Boys. Yes, the Dudley Boys were on the pre-show, um, which in itself is quite sad when you consider yeah. literally just last week we were hearkening them as one of the best tag teams in WWE <laughs> history. And here they are on the pre-show taking on two mass luchadors that can't do shit. Um, obviously, I know they both improved now. Obviously, they're nowhere near as botchy now as they were. But at the time, you genuinely worried whenever Kalisto or Sin Cara went near a rope. Um, yeah. <laughs> they still managed to get the victory over the Dudley boys, which is both alarming and saddening. But um, yeah, pre-show, Golden Truth and Lucha Dragons both picking up victories. Moving on to the main card. We opened up with a fatal four-way tag team match for the WWE Tag Team Championships. This was obviously pre-brand um, split. Uh, the brand split was coming into effect. This was the last pay-per-view um, before the brand split. Obviously, Battleground, which was the next the next one. Everyone had been drafted, but they still had feuds to sort out. Um, so, a lot of mentions of the brand draft and... Obviously, we had no split tag team division. It was all just for this one championship, and that was between Enzo and Cass, who came out, popped the crowd. Um, yeah. Obviously, it makes me sort of miss Enzo and Cass, but then I have also seen Enzo's new rap video, which is <laughs> Diatribe. It's honestly... Imagine it him just Kendrick bitching? Lamar. Imagine the worst white Kendrick Lamar tribute act and that is Enzo Amore's new song. It is utterly atrocious. It's shit. Um, well, this this promo was pretty cringy. It was. It wasn't Enzo's finest by any stretch of the imagination, in fact. But they were still over massively. And I do mm -hmm. miss them as a tag team because Big Cass is now for some strange reason being pushed as this shit heel which is just doing nothing on SmackDown. He's not he's not getting a boo, he's not getting a cheer, he's getting nothing, which is even worse. Um, but do. here, you know, they were both massively, massively over. Gallows and Anson arrived to a massive pop. Obviously, they just arrived into the WWE with AJ Styles, still massively over. Uh -huh. Genuinely underrated theme tune. I yeah, do really good. like Omen in the Sky. Very, very good song. Uh, the Vaude Villains... Oh, God. Poor Vaude such, Villains. 
I th- I think that they were such a wasted gimmick. It's such a good entrance. It's just the word. They should have been given more time, I think. Well, because from te- NXT they were totally amazing. At NXT. Yeah. Um, I went back um about two years ago now, and started watching NXT from you know from 2014 when it was really good. Yeah. Uh, when you had the you know in air quotes the golden generation of NXT, and the Vaude villains were fantastic. Same with the Ascension. And the Vaude villains, when they got bought up, took the main roster, everyone, everyone said the exact same thing. They've got a fantastic gimmick. It's quirky. It's Vince isn't going to get it. They're going to be completely buried on the main roster. Yeah. Sure enough, what happened? They got buried on the main roster. And totally. here they were in, they were literally in the match to take the pinfall. Mm-hmm. That is all. That is the only reason they were in this match. And then, of course, once these three teams were in the ring, we had the New Day. Um, Come out, so massive, massive. So <laughs> yeah, just it's the new day. They did the new day thing. Biggie and Kofi Kingston were the ones in this match. Bloody hell, this was a mess. Did you did you hear as well in commentary? And I, I had to rewind it because I thought they picked it up and they said um, the new day were holding the belt for however many days because the 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 longest reigning champions were Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Yes, I did hear that. And I thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> Isn't it a demolition? Yeah, but this is what happens, Garth, when you are embroiled in a lawsuit with the WWE. They scrub right. you from the face of the earth. Um, I just thought, it, to- it totally caught us, caught us out. I was like, what? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was... I don't know whether they... Did demolition have the longest single run or did they have the longest cumulative run as tag champs? I th- I, I always assumed it was just the longest sort of, like, one stint with the belt. Well, that's what I thought, because I'm sure Demolition had it twice, and I'm sure the first one, they didn't have it for that long. Mm. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. We need to do our research on that. I know that Paul <laughs> London and uh, Brian Kendrick did hold them for, it was ages, about 400 days, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah. It, it, I know they did mention it. It's not a great, it wasn't a great time for tag team wrestling, if I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest. I was going to say. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you probably realise that we're actually skirting around this match and the re- the reason we are skirting around <laughs> this match is because literally nothing of note happened. Um, it was... They, t- they did mention Lord Tenzai. They did mention Lord Tenzai and I miss <laughs> Lord Tenzai. I feel like there is a Lord Tenzai shaped hole in the current WWE roster. Um, it's just, unfortunately, the only thing that came from this match was that Gallows and Anderson came across quite strong, even though they obviously didn't end up winning. Um, they looked like the powerhouse. Cass was given his usual shtick of booting people. Booting Enzo people. got himself yeah. in trouble. Then had to have Cass bail him out. Vord Villains were the people taking all the moves. Simon Gotch, don't even know why he was there. Um, <laughs> and eventually, um, we got into the finishing sequence where Aiden English was hit with a magic killer as... Carl Anderson went for the pinfall. Big E literally lifted, deadlifted him that was off really the good, pinfall eh? into like this into the position for a German. Uh, got him into a big ending and obviously then hit with uh, Midnight Hour. Um, all the while, all the while, thing he's standing there. Yes. Also, Aiden English still on the mat. Yeah. Uh, Kofi then covers, and Aiden English still, even after the fact that. You know, there has been all this action around him. Still can't kick out, and the New Day retain. It was... Just uh, messy. Yeah, it was... If you think about it, you'd obviously got the Fatal 4-Way tag team match at Mania 33, which was fantastic, which had Enzo and Cass, Gallows and Anderson, and then you got Sheamus and Cesaro, and obviously you've got the Hardys as well. Yeah. But if you look at... That match, and you can't say it's just because it was a ladder match, because I don't think the ladders played that much of a part in that match. No. If you look at what they did there, and look at what they did here, there was very, very little in the way of big spots. There was very little in the way of entertainment. It just seemed like they'd been told, right, this is what you, this is the time you've got. Yeah. Try and fit as much as you can in. Who cares if the audience are going to follow it? Just get it in, get out, <laughs> get off, because we have got another eight matches or whatever it is on the card and we have got to give Titus O'Neil time. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I'm not joking. 
Um, so yeah, the New Day retain as you know we knew they would because obviously they had this longest title reign, eclipsing both Demolition and Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Obviously, <laughs> uh, this took us to a feud between Baron Corbin and Dolph Ziggler. Uh, Baron Corbin got bought up after WrestleMania 32, um, where. WWE had to plaster together a card with just an unbelievable spate of injuries. Uh, Baron Corbin was brought up from NXT. I thought, if I'm perfectly honest, a couple of months too soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was still very green. Um, but as is the case with any NXT call-up, they must go through the gatekeeper. That gatekeeper <laughs> is Dolph Ziggler. And this was standard fare. You the whole brick Dolph. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you shall not pass. Um, he's, he's, doing his best, he's doing his best to show Michael's impression here. He is. And do you know what? I feel it's too late for Dolph Ziggler now. Though I do appreciate, yeah. I do really like what they're doing at the moment with him and Drew McIntyre um, at the moment in modern day. Here, he could still have been, because don't forget this is pre-brand split, so it's pre- the feud he had with the Miz over the Intercontinental Championship over on SmackDown, which was fantastic, by the way, yeah. um, later on this year. Um, I just feel like he could have been so much more. Well, he got a massive cheer. He did, when he came because off. he's still massively over. But unfortunately, he's had so many stop, start pushes. You know, injuries coming at the worst possible yeah. time. Um, and I heard someone talking not so long ago about Adam Cole being the next Shawn Michaels, and mm-hmm. he is, of course, you know, Adam Cole's going to be absolutely massive on the main roster. I can't wait. But looking back at it, Dolph Ziggler could have been that for years. He could have oh, been yeah. a main event star because he's good on the mic, fantastic in the ring, phenomenal seller, one mm-hmm. of the best sellers in WWE even today. And for me, Dolph Ziggler carried Baron Corbin to a serviceable match here. What was it? I thought it was... One like one of the better, not one of the better matches, but of the non-main matches, it's probably the best of the first half of the card. It was the best match. Yeah, it's uh, like and that is unfortunately not a glowing indictment of the first half of the show. Um, I thought it was um a bit harsh on the whole match when the fans started booing, yeah. seeing boring and shouting boring and things. It's, yeah, but don't forget what they had just seen was car crash TV in the tag team match. Yeah, I suppose. Um, so you got I, that like. I quite like the whole Corbin thing where he was basically trying to piss the crowd off. I liked Corbin when the draft happened and he had a role. He was the dominant monster on SmackDown. Now he's on Raw where (laughs) there is Bobby Lashley, where there is Braun Strowman, where there is, don't forget, still returning, The Big Show. Yeah. What is Baron Corbin supposed to do over there? And unfortunately, he's just put in a, well, his last couple of matches have been against No Way Fucking Jose. Oh God. So well, yeah, I mean, exactly. He's been buried already, has he? What No Way Jose? Like, yeah. Because yeah. nobody saw that coming. Adam Rose Part Two. Um, yeah. But here, you know, standard fair. Baron Corbin hit his power moves. Ziggler sold like an absolute champ. Towards the end of this match, when Ziggler hit that super kick. Oh, the re- re- from the reversal. From the reversal from yeah. the uh, attempted end of days. That was fantastic. Yeah, really The crowd good. popped big. Genuinely, I was like, oh my God, does Ziggler win this? <laughs> Bearing in mind, he pins AJ Styles in a number one contendership match with a super kick. Baron yeah. Corbin is so much stronger than AJ Styles, who obviously manages to kick out. He hits a deep six on the outside. Dolph Ziggler slaps the matting on the outside when yeah. uh, Corbin hits the deep six. Corbin eventually hits him with the end of days. One, two, three. Corbin gets the victory. Um, Corbin's move set, when you consider <laughs> he has both deep six and end of days, which are both amazing moves. Yeah. Um, also, Ziggler, well done for correcting yourself as you fell over the stairs. Well done. Oh, yeah, I saw that bit, yeah. That um, was good. <laughs> for those who didn't see it, Ziggler... Attempted to run from the side of the ring and attempted to use the stairs to jump at Corbin. Missed his footing and sort of half splashed, like half cross bodied, half just kind of <laughs> fell on his face towards Corbin. And Corbin 
to his credit, caught Ziggler, sort of lifted him up, and then hit deep six. So yeah. it was a small botch, but still quite noticeable and still quite funny, especially as it was fluffy hair, Dolph, as well, which just makes everything <laughs> better. Uh, <laughs> but yes, um, Corbin won and would use that momentum to just do nothing for a while. Um, this brought us on to... Um, <laughs> Possibly the worst two matches of the... Co- no, 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 I've just seen the semi-main <laughs> event. Um, these two matches next. We're going to start with the women's tag match. Charlotte and Dana Brooke against Becky Lynch and face Natalia, and you'll see why I've emphasised that in a moment. This <laughs> was This was not good. No. This was not good at all. And I don't know if it's because Dana Brooke slowed the pace down because, of course, she was a recent call she up as was well. Absolutely shocking as well. Yeah, she <laughs> seemed to be more bothered about shouting at Becky than actually performing moves. Um, and the desecration of the heart attack. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, Basically, Becky and Natalia attempted a heart attack, which, for those who don't know, uh, why are you here? Um, (laughs) But seriously, for those who don't know, it's a tag team finisher performed by Jim the Anvil Neidhart and Bret Hart, and it's one of the most impactful tag team finishers of all time. And (laughs) this was a piss-poor interpretation of it. Imagine for a moment the impact that Jeff Hardy had at the Greatest Royal Rumble when he missed Jinder Mahal with the Whisper in the Wind (laughs) by about a fortnight. And that is the impact this heart attack had. Um, From what I remember, it's Natalia who got Dana Brooke up, I think. Yeah. And then Becky Lynch attempted the clothesline. And I don't know whether Dana Brooke just fell early or... It was... It was just peculiar. And... Again, you've got Charlotte, the women's champion, who is just absolutely incredible. You've got Becky Lynch, who is an incredible performer. You've got Natalia, who's good in the ring. You've got Dana Brooke, who's also <laughs> there. Um, I just I don't understand how this match was as poor as it was, and I don't know if it was because it was only given seven minutes or whether it's because they had to compensate for Dana's greenness just, in the ring. There was just nothing is. in it. It just... Even the crowd... I said before, when we were talking about Cass on SmackDown now, he doesn't get a reaction, which is worrying. It's more worrying than getting the opposite. At least Roman Reigns elicits a reaction. It's not the right reaction, but at least he elicits one. Here, it's just nothing. And again, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, how can you not have a reaction to this? It's like it was all all just a vehicle for what happened after the the Yeah, the world's most telegraphed um, heel turn. So Dana Brooke does one thing right and actually moves out of the way as Becky Lynch attempts to go for um, Dana. She ducks. Becky ends up hitting Natalia instead by accident. And Natalia's then hit with natural selection and pinned by Charlotte. Um, Becky Lynch and Natalia stand in the ring looking mortified and upset for some reason because this match had literally no no like attachments to it. It didn't matter. Dana Brooke filled with a full sense of accomplishment while Charlotte sort of goes look I did it, back off Dana and Natalia turns on (laughs) Becky for no reason at all and what did the crowd do? Fuck all (laughs) Fuck all I don't know what they they thought was going to happen, whether they thought that oh my god Natalia's turning heel and they thought the crowd would go wild, no, most of the crowd were either buying hot dogs or in the toilet because this was the piss break match Apart from that one guy who the, helped throughout the whole pay per view was so melodramatic. The guy with the football top. It, it was I either didn't a, see him. I didn't see it him. Was otherwise, either, I noted it down. It was either a Bayern Munich top or a Toronto. It's whoever had like sort of T Mobile on the front. Oh, it was, was Bayern so, Munich. Yeah, I do. I do know so, what you mean. He was so into it. <laughs> because you know, why wouldn't you be into it? Look who's part of this match. It was it was brilliant. It Especially was... the uh, the main event. Oh god. Yeah, I know. I just <sighs> Yeah. Obviously we'd had the women's revolution and unfortunately this just, just it was pointless. it was a very poor match. Very poor match. 
No real build up to it, no real need for it. And of course, it was a vehicle for Natalia's poorly received heel turn, where she just shouts a lot and likes cats, apparently. Mm. Um, this brought us to. <sighs> this, brought... <laughs> this brought us to a match between Seamus and Apollo Crews. Now, I've done podcasts in the past where I've detailed why I think Apollo Crews was brought up years too early years too early um and this was a huge huge sort of indication as to why you know as to how he was being received by the audience just his music hit nobody cared nobody cared at least at least people hate Seamus so you know at least he got booed but this was all built on the fact that even the, was, I, was, I, was, I was just going to say the, the feud. <laughs> it was just built on the fact that Seamus was old guard and Apollo Crews had apparently said once that he was, you know, he was just happy to be there and he was going to make WWE the new era and <laughs> Seamus took offence to that. Not entirely sure why. Um, then on SmackDown, Apollo Crews slapped Seamus so hard he <laughs> fell into some boxes and got <laughs> laughed at by some mid-carders who were standing next to him. Uh, and that apparently warranted a pay-per-view match. And Jesus. Shocked. Um, it's so so bad. It wasn't even that it's bad because Apollo Crews is phenomenal in the ring. He really is. And I wish, I wish the WWE would do something with him. Yes, I know he's part of Titus Worldwide at the moment, but that <laughs> seems to be a black hole because Dana Brooks there as well. Um and Titus, for God's sake. I just I feel like he's got so much to offer and he's just not he's not being used at all. It's, Seamus it's, is a good wrestler. Yeah. I like Seamus. Yeah, I have no problem with Seamus. Yeah, he was dreadful as part of the League of Nations, but so was everyone apart from Rusev. I, I mean Apollo Cruz, I think a lot of it is just he's just so bland. There's nothing to attach to. He had no opportunity during his time in NXT. He'd got, he'd had no opportunity to develop a character. Yeah. To develop his niche area, and he was found wanting on a lot of occasions during his during the main roster. Um, and this was a massive point because the audience were like, "Okay, this is Apollo Cruz, the old Uha Nation. Why should we care?" <laughs> Which is a shame because anyone who anyone who's watched Uha Nation matches, YouTube them, he is phenomenal. He's brilliant in the ring. And look at him. He's a chiseled Adonis. I know. And just, I don't say that yeah. lightly. But it just it, it was a very, very boring match. Very boring. Again, like the tag match, nothing at all to say about it until the end. Until the ending sequence. Um, Seamus tried a white noise off the top rope uh, that was a near fall and Cruz eventually pinned Seamus <laughs> that, that was, that's literally it so um, a, I mean Cruz didn't even really get much offence in at all no Seamus dominates him it was just a sort of roll up sort of totally unexpected win it's like a crucifix pin wasn't it, it was Yeah. Just it, the audience were given no reason to care about this match, no reason to care about Apollo Crews, no reason to care about Sheamus, no reason to care about the feud, no reason to care about the match. Just, yeah. And at this point, I was severely worried that I made a terrible decision. <laughs> um, I, was, I was watching thinking, ah, it's got to get better. Yeah, it it was, yeah, a series of matches with little to no, little to no care or thought put into them. But... That was rectified in this next match. AJ Styles versus John Cena in the first of their phenomenal trilogy over the next year. They had this, they had SummerSlam, and they had the Royal Rumble. And though this was probably, I wouldn't say the worst of the three, this was the lesser of the three. This was still a fantastic match. A much-needed injection into the pay-per-view, much-needed injection into the audience. Um, and... Yeah, John Cena it's one, bought it. AJ Styles bought say, it. It's it's one of those matches where Cena's taken out of his comfort zone and he thrives. And you know what? I loved the story of this match. John Cena yeah. for 
however long, has been labelled five moves of doom. And every time he tried to get into a rhythm with one of his five moves of doom, AJ Styles would reverse it. Yeah. And the for however much I lambasted JBL at the start of the podcast, they all, all three of the commentary team, did a fantastic job of building just how much John Cena was struggling, especially in the early parts of this match. Because yeah. every time John Cena would attempt the five-knuckle shuffle, he'd get a kick in the head. Every time he tried a back body drop, he got a Pele kick. Every time he tried um, an AA, it'd get reversed into a calf crusher or an, at- no, not an attitude adjustment into a um, Styles clash or a phenomenal forearm. And AJ Styles, for three quarters of this match, had seen a beat. And Cena, yeah. the just... The confusion and the frustration on his face was brilliant, and that's an excellent story to tell in the ring. Mm-hmm. Um, the only the only issue I had with the, like the first portion of this match was when Cena locked in his STF. Oh God! I... Now I don't have a problem with the STF as a move. If it's locked in properly, it can be legitimately quite painful, especially when you've got Cena's body weight on top of you. <laughs> but there was no talk at all on Styles' back, neck or head. Nothing. The probably the only place that had any tension was probably around Styles' chin. Yes, because like, he got he with his forearms. seen his pythons around his head. Uh-huh. But there was just there was no talk at all. And AJ Styles, poor AJ Styles having to sell it like he's been stabbed in the throat and trying to crawl across the ring like, well I could quite I could quite easily just fall asleep with this on. I don't I, I get sometimes I watch matches and I think why do WWE even have submission moves as signatures or finishes anymore? Because very, very rarely do they actually work. Yeah, look at the walls of Jericho. No one submitted. Very, very, very few people. Obviously, Kevin Owens um, in the at the SmackDown after Mania. Yeah. But just add, it seems to be a dying art. The more impactful moves are sort of being brought to the fore because you've got an audience who want to see that. They don't want to yeah. see rest holds. They don't want to see someone being locked in a submission for God knows how long. Of course, there's one used um, in the semi-main event, but that's different. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's different. That's Rusev. We love Rusev. Um, eventually, Cena manages to actually get an attitude adjustment. Style kicks out. Um, Styles managed to hit a Styles clash. Cena kicks that- out. That um, where he does the A in the like the um, the calf killer. Oh, the calf crusher! That was fantastic. really calf crusher. Sorry, yeah, absolutely amazing. Styles and then, looked um, fantastic in this match. And then, like you say, that the A and then the kick out. I, I honestly thought that was going to be the end of the match because I groaned. Yeah, so did so I. I Styles like, oh. literally. If the if there was a two point nine, that is when Styles kicked out of the AA. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, there was one bit where Cena's on the outside. And Styles attempts a corkscrew plancher. Yeah. And Cena moves. Oh, yeah. Good <laughs> grief, the slap on the mat. That St- and the way Styles lands. Like sideways. Like, how has he not broken his hip? <laughs> it is such a bad bump, but he just he just gets up. Um, yeah. There's the one on the, um, where Cena does a sort of like, like back body drop onto the rope. Oh, yeah, he's um, on the back the of corner. his head. Yeah. Yeah, the it he takes a lot of like poor bumps in this AJ Styles. He does bump a lot for Cena. Um but the entire premise of this match, as we've already talked about, um, was AJ Styles having Cena's number, and this was playing into the fact that Cena had sort of goaded AJ Styles into taking this match without the help of the club. Um it said, You can take me on with the club, that's fine, but you're letting them down, you're letting yourself down, and did his whole I'm an angry dad. So yeah. speech to a Styles played Styles hotline and sinker signed for the match that said the club wouldn't be involved. Sure enough, Cena has um, AJ Styles up for the AA, a third AA. Um, the ref takes a needlessly big bump from being sort of tapped with um, AJ Styles' boot. He's out of the ring. Cena hits the AA, goes for the cover. The crowd count one, two, three, which was brilliant. Um, obviously, no referee to count it. The club come down. Hit Cena with a magic killer, run out of the ring. Luke Gallows running, hilarious. <laughs> um, and and AJ, they sort of lob AJ Styles on top of Cena. One, two, three. 
AJ Styles wins. Um, I think a lot of people on that second AA, just came back to that, a lot of people thought that it was the thought it was the finish because you heard people in the audience groan as well. <laughs> you heard yeah. people in the audience go, oh, I don't fucking believe this bullshit. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> yeah. Is he really burying AJ Styles, for God's sake? But no. And obviously these two would go on to have a fantastic feud on SmackDown, some fantastic matches, an absolutely fantastic promo battle between them on SmackDown just before the Royal Rumble. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yep. Um, probably... The best match of the night, I would definitely say. Definitely one, yeah, definitely one of the best, yeah. Um, next, we had the Money in the Bank ladder match. And earlier on in the night, we had had a promo with Kevin Owens. <laughs> now, this promo was absolutely amazing. Kevin Owens versus Chris Jericho. But just, uh, just give these two a microphone and just let them talk. Because <laughs> honestly, they are fantastic. Even when Alberto Del Rio came in, it, it, was, t- it was really yeah. funny. Oh, what are you, you going to do? Tell... You're going to call me Pedre? Because that's all you've got. It means dog. How do you that... know? Do you speak Spanish now? <laughs> I learned it when he kept calling it to me. It's just like, you can tell he's ad-libbing as well. Yeah, Kevin Owens catch... is fantastic ca- on the mic. He catches Jericho out. No, both of them, fantastic. And both of them, massively over. This ladder match, um, Del Rio, Cesaro, Jericho, Owens, Zane, and Ambrose... There's no one in this match, with the exception of Del Rio, who again got no reaction whatsoever. No one in this match wasn't over. And I don't think, again, with the exception of Del Rio, who was the only person in this match to have won it before, there was no one who could have won this match that anyone would have been disappointed with. Yeah. Um, I thought Del Rio had a really good match, to be honest. He did. It's the best match I've seen Del Rio have. I thought he did really, really well. He was hard-hitting. He was impactful. When Kevin Owens Some was climbing the, the ladder bit. and Del Rio brought him down with a backbreaker, yeah. that was amazing. That was amazing. A backstabber, jumped, sorry. When he um, jumped on Jericho as well, yeah. off the ladder. It was amazing. Just Jericho stomped on his back. It was, yeah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, obviously, you had Owens and Zayn from God knows how long ago. You got NXT and Ring of Honor before that, and here they really did hurt each other. You've got Sami Zayn hit... Oh, my God. There was a ladder on its side. Oh, and yeah. Zayn... Did he just... Did he powerbomb him? Just backdrop. backdrop oh, I did think, he just backdrop him? Yeah. Backdropped Owens, like small of the back first, onto the side of the ladder. And the way Owens was sort of draped over this ladder, I was like, oh, well, that's <laughs> it. We've killed Kevin Owens. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And genuinely, sitting bit... on my own, I just went, oh, my God. I did. I, I had. I rewound it a couple of times to watch. I was like, everyone says that. Oh well, the wrestlers are always fine. The wrestlers are always fine. Wrestling's fake. I was like, yeah, no, but no, no. how? How was Kevin Owens okay after this? Because this was like what? Still with about ten minutes of the match to go. So there was the bit. There was the bit with um, Jericho with the where he had Ambrose in the ladder, and he was just slamming it down on him. Oh, God. He kept saying like sixty nine pounds, sixty nine pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I love their feud; it was hilarious. Um, Cesaro looked really good during this. There was one bit where he was climbing a ladder and he jumped off the ladder onto the middle rope and <laughs> sprung off the middle rope to hit Kevin Owens with a European uppercut, and it just looked yeah. amazing. And it just makes me wish that Cesaro was better on the microphone because if he was, he'd be a bona fide main eventer. I wish he would would stop using the um, that stupid uppercut in the corner all the time because it's just I don't know it's just so overused. <laughs> yes, there was a bit where he had three people in the court in separate corners and he just ran uppercutting all of them, uh, and then eventually that got halted by a super kick, which was quite funny. By that was uh, Kevin, and there was the, the bit where he um, did a giant swing. Yes, Jericho into the ladder. <laughs> I just loved his facial expression just before he did it as though to go. Oh, Jericho! Oh, all right. Um, the only person, really, who didn't do anything mental was Dean Ambrose. Yeah. And for He's, me... He was this sort tele- of like out of it for a long... Yeah, yeah. This, is, this for me telegraphed who was going to win the ladder match because everyone else had done big, big spots. Kevin Owens got his re- uh, revenge on Sami Zayn by powerbombing him onto a ladder, <laughs> um, which, again, Sami Zayn so- sold amazingly. Ambrose, the only thing he did, really, was hit Jericho with an elevated... 
um, Dirty Deeds. Oh, yeah, Off the Ladder. Off the Ladder, which looked, again, looked really, really good. But... Del Rio did that bit in the corner with the ladder with Sami Zayn and then uh, Cesaro. Yeah, who was it that flung Cesaro? There was a ladder with, um, on the top rope, sort of coming into the ring, and someone Irish whipped Cesaro into it. And the way Cesaro sold it is though he'd been hitting the head with it. That was Del Rio, I think. Was yeah. it Del Rio? Yeah. Honestly, it looked brilliant. Um, and then you got the typical spot at the top where they were all at the top on different ladders fighting. That that, that looks brilliant. Like that was a really good shot. Yeah, it was. And then the ladder got knocked over with Del Rio and Cesaro on it. Cesaro obviously falls first on the top ladder. But did you see the bump Del Rio took? Yeah, because he sort of landed on the top rope with his feet, and then just sort of just flopped. Flipped. Yeah, into the ring. It was. It looked extremely painful. It looked very painful. There was the um, Sami Zayn hit the double holyover kick on Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho. Yeah. Um, but eventually, um, after Owens, so- Sammy Sami Zayn did everything he could not to win. To take the briefcase. Yes, there was one bit where Jericho <laughs> was on top of the ladder as well, and rather than actually taking the briefcase, just hit it with his hand to yeah, make it like swing. It. <laughs> uh, which was infuriating to watch. Um, but yeah, after Kevin Owens had power bombed Sami Zayn onto this ladder, he ascended to the top. Ambrose, sprightly because he'd done nothing in the match, uh, ascended <laughs> to the ladder as well, sort of grabbed. Kevin Owens threw the ladder and started that pulling him into the ladder, banging his head onto the ladder, and then threw him off. He crashed into a ladder. Ambrose left at the top. He took a bloody age taking that suitcase down. But it looked like he he, he did it on purpose. Yeah. It was just really slowly sort of, like, I don't know. It looked quite good, actually. It did, to be honest, the way the match played out was perfect. And I think the right person won... Everyone got the licks in. You know, I know Del Rio wasn't long before he left the company, which is a shame because here, as you said, he looked fantastic. Yeah. Cesaro, again, got buried after this match before, <laughs> again, finding tag team success with Sheamus. Owens and Zayn just were fantastic. Owens would obviously go on to be Universal Champion. Sami Zayn would go on to be, you know, the perpetual loser that he was before was this, he turned heel. Was this before... Um... Jericho. Uh, Owens. Uh, Jericho and Owens was a was it after SummerSlam? I think it was after SummerSlam because it? it was only after Owens had got the Universal Championship and yeah. that was at that was the raw after SummerSlam, I think. Because I think Bauer had to retire it, didn't he? Oh sorry, I um, That's one of my favourite uh, teams of all time. <laughs> yeah. Jericho and, Owens. Jericho and Owens were fantastic together. Absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, obviously we'd had too much of a good thing then with two good matches in a row when we were given the United States Championship match between <laughs> Rusev and Titus O'Fucking Neil. How the fuck is he in this match? I, I do not know. Is it because he was dad of the year? I think that's probably okay. why it was. It was Father's okay, Day. I'm seeing it. And he was given, was it the Celebrity Father of the Year or something? Yeah. Um, some manner of bullshit award. And I'm guessing this was after he'd served a suspension for touching Vince. Yes. Yeah, presumably. Presumably. Um, and, yeah, he proceeded to oh, amble shit. around the ring in one of the slowest-paced matches I've ever seen in my life. He came down to the ring, kissed his son on the lips. That's not okay. Never okay. <laughs> um, came into the ring... Rusev promptly rolled out of the ring and started taunting his family, which was quite funny. Then they both hit running clotheslines. I was going to say that that was fucking hell. Jesus Christ, they hit each other hard. (laughs) If you watch anything from this match, and good God, why would you? um, Watch that first bit, just the opening 30 seconds, then turn it off. Rusev wins, (laughs) we'll spoil it for you. Um, At least we got got to see Lana. That's true. Oh, Lana. Oh, Lana. So, you know, there's always a silver cloud. Always silver lining to that cloud. Um, but yeah, Titus O'Neil, he's got nothing to him. He's got no moves. No. Um, <laughs> he's got no person. Well, he's, he's got a bit of charisma, I suppose. But people just don't care about him at all. They didn't then. They didn't when he was part of the primetime players. Rusev's over because he's Rusev and he was supposed to be the heel. Um, you know, before long, O'Neill is locked in the accolade and he taps out without really. <laughs> doing anything 
Yeah. It's, it's just, it's a bamboozling match. And I understand why it's placed on the card here. Because obviously you've got, you've just had the action of AJ Styles, Cena, Ambrose winning the Money in the Bank briefcase. And you need that palate cleanser before the main event. Yeah. But even so, this was hard to watch. It was terrible. It was a it's bad, just... bad match. Uh, in fact, the best thing about this match was once Rusev had won, he went down, took the microphone, and started <laughs> taunting uh, Titus O'Neil's son, calling his dad a loser, and then just started saying Happy Father's Day. <laughs> that it was that was the best bit because Rusev is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> um, this brought us to our main event, which JBL told us was the best fight to ever take place in Las Vegas because yeah. JBL is a factoid man, apparently. Um, we had Seth Rollins taking on Roman Reigns, who was the current WWE heavyweight champion. Now, this would have gone down as a bit more of a surprise had Roman Reigns not publicly failed a drugs test and everyone <laughs> known about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Roman Reigns had failed the wellness policy um, and was, you know, obviously punished by having his title taken off him. Um, was gone for 30 days and was then punished further by being made to carry the United States Championship. It's hard life sometimes, isn't it? The um, the video package was really good for this, because yeah. I couldn't really remember the feud, but yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was literally, Seth Rollins was on top of the world, he injured his knee quite badly, and they were very, very graphic with his knee. Um, yeah. Obviously, in his absence, Reigns went on to get the title at WrestleMania 32, Rollins came back at Extreme Rules, pedigreed Reigns, and basically said, I want my title back. I never lost it. You can't beat me. And he then proceeded to bury Roman Reigns in promos, where Reigns would just kind of stand there smiling, which is what he does. And this match was given to us, and it was a really, really good match. Yeah, A I really was... good match. Yeah, um, I thought it started a touch slowly, but obviously... I'm thinking Seth Rollins probably did that on purpose. Obviously, you've got the commentary mm-hmm. team talking about ring rust. Um, but once it kicked into gear, this was fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Reigns got all his moves in. Uh, he got the crucifix powerbomb off the top rope. Oh, brilliant. Which was really, really good because you could see every sinew of him straining to get Rollins <laughs> up. And fair play to him. It looked really, really good. Rollins kicked out. Uh, Reigns hit two Superman punches, uh, Rollins kicked out. There was one bit then, and I want to talk about this, where Rollins was on the outside, and Reigns goes for a spear. Yeah. And with the force, (laughs) he hits the barricade at. Good grief. I'm surprised he didn't put his shoulder out. He hits that barricade to the point where the barricade just fell apart. Yeah. And it was only Reigns that hit it because obviously as he'd gone for the spear, Rollins moved. But just oh my god. Oh my god, it looked it looked he, horrendous. He sold the fact that he was dazed really well. He did. Yeah, he did. Until he until he got in the ring and got up. <laughs> yeah. Then he got in the ring and attempted a spear again, which made no sense. Um, but the, um the the one of the best bits I, when I I remember watching it the first time and I thought it was a bit crap, but the second time Made more sense where Rollins does the corner power bomb, and yeah. on on the bounce back, um, Reigns does the Superman, Superman punch. punch. Yeah, and at, I remember watching it at the time thinking, "God, that's shit," but then watching it back, I was like, "No, it makes sense." Yeah, because he's fallen forward anyway, and, and he gets it. And he I did thought, that not so long. Ago. I think he did that at Battleground as well, and people were he? like, "Oh well, you know that took Sting out, and Reigns is just okay." And it's like, "Well, no, watch." The momentum is taking him towards Rollins anyway. He's just mm-hmm. taken one last swipe at Rollins and then they both yeah. go down. Reigns, that was really for good. all the people who criticise his selling, sold really, really well in this match. Oh, yeah. Really like, well. Yeah. He made Rollins, not that Rollins needs any help whatsoever, but made him look like an absolute million dollars here. He really did. There was Some of the, um, the, the sort of really late kickouts are really good as well. Yeah, really. Especially so many false Rollins. finishes. Yeah, absolutely. The the similar to the um, Cena Styles match, mm-hmm. just absolutely fantastic. My favourite bit though has got to be where Reigns goes for a spear and Rollins counts it with a pedigree, just yeah. all in one so fluid good. motion. Yeah, it looked amazing. 
I love the fact that they um, they still did the sunset flip powerbomb off the rope, which obviously <laughs> had been the move that injured Rollins for seven months. And the fact the commentary yeah. team played on that, that was amazing. Um, they did the, um, that suplex into the Falcon Arrow. That was yeah. like really smooth. And I mean, to be fair, like Rollins doesn't look it, but he's actually like really, really quite powerful. Yes, he's really to strong. Lift, yeah. To lift up Rollins like that. Uh, to lift up Reigns, sorry. Yeah, because Reigns isn't Reigns isn't exactly thin. I he... did. A, there was a bit where um, they were outside. It was I think it might have been after Reigns missed the the outside spear, and Michael Cole says um, he needs to get Reigns back into the ring because a count out doesn't help anybody. He says, uh, apart from the champion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good call, good yeah. call. So, so it does help someone, <laughs> and you can sort of like in the background you can you can hear um, JBL sort of. Chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, so, yeah, this match was fantastic. Reigns, obviously, after he attempted the spear and been pedigreed by um, Rollins, he kicked out of two. Rollins, straight away, going back up, second pedigree, won at the match and the championship. And there was a massive, massive pop for Rollins, considering yeah. Rollins was the heel in this <laughs> feud. You know, the crowd went absolutely mental, even though yeah. it was forecast beforehand. I think it's one of those ones where, with Rollins, it it was one of those ones where you can't deny that he's a favourite. No. And, and that the fans are going to cheer him. That's why I'm glad he's a face now. Yeah. Because, yes, he was a fantastic heel, and yes, he was an absolutely fantastic chicken shit heel as well when he was part of the authority. Mm-hmm. But... I feel like he's that good in the ring. He's got that much high-flying offense. It's difficult for him to be a heel. And we've spoken, I think we spoke about it at WrestleMania, the WrestleMania 34 review, where we said Rollins was struggling to be the face of the company. Since he's been the Intercontinental Champion, just being a face seems to come second nature to him. And people, because he's Rollins, and because he keeps putting on these absolutely outstanding matches with people he has no right to be having a fantastic match with, you know, people love him. Absolutely. Lovely. I mean, you look at this match, and if you if you didn't know, if you just start, if you just give that match to somebody and said, "You tell me who the bad guy and the, the good guy is," you would immediately say Rollins is the good guy here. Yeah, and of the Reigns is the obvious heel because Reigns, even the way he was playing the match, was being the heel. Yeah, and do you know what? For those people who were chanting, "You can't wrestle," to Roman Reigns, shut up. Oh, they're just fucking uh, idiots. Um, but I think in the this crowd, match, not th- this match, sort of shows that they could have a really good feud again if they dare to turn Reigns heel. It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting because, like I say, there was people chanting at the at the show. You can't wrestle, oh, fucking idiots. Yes, he can wrestle. Cool. That's well, not the that. issue that people have with him. It's the issue that he's been forced on our throats. But that's not his yeah. fault. Um, obviously. This wasn't the end of the show because as Rollins was celebrating, Dean Ambrose cashed in. <laughs> I, 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 I just completely and utterly forgot about this. And when his music hit, I actually, I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Honestly, um, you could hear the crowd. And obviously Ambrose um, cashed in. Rollins is looking at the ramp sort of going, there's no way you're going to catch me out. I've got this. I've got this. <laughs> From behind, Ambrose, uh, briefcase to the face, dirty deeds, and your new WWE champion is Dean Ambrose. I thought that was excellent, really well done. Yeah, the entire of this match and this feud and then their triple threat of Battleground and everything that came after this was fantastic. The WWE give them credit where credit is due. Everything they did with the Ambrose, Reigns and Rollins triangle in this sort of period before the brand split was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. And you can YouTube, there's a promo between Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. And Rollins says, you do not deserve that championship. And Ambrose looks at him, gives him just a cold stare and just says, just think for a minute. Just think about what I've been through to get this title. And then he sort of gets closer to Rollins and says, and now I want you to think about it. If I'm willing to do that to get it, what do you think I'm willing to do to keep it? And it's just like, oh my God, you're amazing, Dean. Yeah. <laughs> and I prefer intense, like proper batshit insane Dean to silly Dean. 
like cookie yeah. sort of. Dean's yeah. not supposed to be that. Zany. King Lunatic Fringe. What kind of a bloody nickname is that? Oh, it's fucking. It's a song. It is exactly. <laughs> so, anyway, this was fantastic. Everything that came out of this show was fantastic regarding the main event and everything going into the brand split and then obviously into the first couple of weeks of SmackDown and Raw. Just absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And that was Money in the Bank 2016. And as we said before, it was a spectacular show of two halves, which seems to be a must on any show we review, Garth. Um, <laughs> there seems to be two halves to it, a really good part and a really shit part. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I did, yeah. I did. Like, I, I, Obviously, the first few matches, I was like, oh, this is going to be hard. But then at the end of it, I came out and I thought that was much better than I actually yeah, remembered as absolutely. well. Absolutely. And I'd give it three and a half stars, which seems to be my go-to rating, to be <laughs> perfectly honest. But I was going to go three. And that was mainly because the first part of this card was so bloody boring. But I'm going to go up to three and a half. And I was tempted to give it four simply because... The end of this card, with the exception of the Rusev Titus O'Neil match, was fantastic. And everything that came out of this worked thematically. You know, yeah. it led into the next pay per view brilliantly. So I was tempted to give it four. If we did three quarter stars, I'd give it three and three quarters. Well, I'd, I'd been marking mine out of ten. And I, I, when the Rollins match finished, I was writing my mark for the overall and I put six and a half. And then when the Dean Ambrose thing happened, I just put it up to a seven. Yeah, I mean... The, <laughs> straight away. The cash-in, leaving the audience with that feel-good factor, just absolutely yeah. brilliant. I mean, they were already the f- on top of the world because, you know, Seth had beaten Reigns. But the fact that Ambrose, who was sort of the downtrodden member of the Shield once they'd broken up, you know, the fact that he was now standing tall, just absolutely fantastic. And if you haven't <laughs> seen the Shield triple threat from Battleground, watch it, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's um, the whole, I think the whole thing was um, the fact that he just won it. Yeah. And it was cashed in straight away. And that rarely, rarely happened. Yeah, it was such a surprise. It really was. And, you know, again, the right person won the briefcase. Right outcome at the end of the night. The right time to do it. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. It makes you wonder, though, genuinely. And this will this is my last thought on it. Do you think Ambrose cashed in because they knew that Reigns would be out for 30 days. I don't know, because I think they had the plans for the three of them before this. Yeah, but to I think throw they've... away the shield triple threat at Battleground. I know. I mean, Battleground I think always... 2016 is a fantastic show, top to bottom, pretty much, with the odd exception. But yeah. the shield triple threat? Really? That's mania. <laughs> yeah, I think they're just... I don't know. I think because obviously Re- this was like Rollins' first combat. They wanted to keep the momentum of him chasing the title. Yeah, potentially. Potentially. Um, so yeah, that is our retro pay-per-view review for Money in the Bank 2016. Now, Money in the Bank 2016 was my choice, which means that, Garth, it is your choice. What are we going to be reviewing next? We are going to do another TNA. Okay. Um... Slammiversary 2006. Wow, going all the way back to... All the way back. Some fantastic TNA years, I believe, 2006. Yeah, well, this was the sort of kick-off point when it sort of... This is when I started really first getting into it. Um, when you had the likes of um, Christine Cage, um, America's Most Wanted, um, you had... It wasn't... It was when um, like Jeff Jarrett was sort of top of the card, but um, it was just a really good time. Um, and the matches in this are to look at them on the card. Now you look at them, you think, eh, doesn't look that good. But there's some unbelievable matches. That, there's a match where AJ Styles teams up with Chris Daniels. Wow! And as a team together, they're absolutely amazing. They work so well together. For that alone, for that alone, I think this is worth a review. Um, it, it, it's them against America's Most Wanted, which was um, James Storm and Chris Harris. Um, Who would briefly arrive in so WWE the, before sort of disappearing and never to be heard from again. Yeah, and I had G- Gail Kim as their manager. Nice. Well, um, And you've got you've got a really good um, like elimination um, X Division match, which is 100 mile an hour. 
the X Division got, was amazing. And you've got a Scott Steiner versus Samoa Joe match. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's Scott Steiner, so it's bound to be, well, car crash if nothing else. Well, it was a time. It was a time when um, he came in, and I think they must have said to him, "Look, you're not going to be, you're not going to be winning anything." So, and they used him to put people over, and he actually did a really good job at the time. Because he put Joe over, he put, um, I'm pretty sure he put AJ and he put Petey Williams over as well. Fair enough. And um, this is when they were really sort of pushing Joe. Yeah. Which they should do because he's fantastic. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's a really good card. Okay. Slammiversary 2006 is our next retro pay-per-view review. But that is all from us this week so if you want to check us out please subscribe to us we are literally everywhere iHeartRadio, stitcher itunes audio boom anchor podbean pippa Castbox. we are everywhere give us a like a subscribe a five star review would really really help us out don't forget to check out the website twitter facebook instagram again we are absolutely everywhere you can talk to me it's at real rob goodwin where can they find you gar uh, at drummer jackson and you can talk to us anytime. We genuinely don't mind. Talk to us, no. argue with us about the podcast. Feel free. We don't mind. Um, yeah. But that's all from us today, and we will speak to you guys again soon. You've been listening to the Podmania Pro Wrestling Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Podmania, Facebook at Podmania Podcasts, and YouTube and Instagram at Real Podmania. And check out the website, podmania.co.uk. Until next time, wrestling fans. Podmania.